nine months after the murder of Joseph Romano, the Axeman of New Orleans returned. This time, it was across the Mississippi River in Gretna. This time, it was grocers Charles and Rose Cortemigla, and one of the most brutal attacks yet, where dead bodies were discovered in their home by their neighbors. Even more brutal, they found in the arms of Rose the dead body of the couple's two-year-old daughter, Mary. The neighbors, also grocers, Orlando Giordano and his 17-year-old son, Frank. The two men claimed they have heard screams coming from the house as they walked past. Upon hearing them, they went in to investigate. When they did, they found a horrific scene that sent them to find an ambulance. Detectives found the same sign panel chiseled from the door and a bloody axe on the back steps of the house, as in the prior attacks in 1918. Nothing has been taken. Rose and Charles both had severe fractures to their skulls, but somehow survived the attack. Several days after the attack, Rose recovered enough to tell detectives she could name her assailants. Rose said it was Orlando and Frank Jordan. Charles denied the claims made by his wife, stating firmly that neither of the Jordanos was the men who attacked him. The police also had their doubts. 17-year-old Frank stood six feet tall and weighed in excess of 200 pounds. How could he have squeezed through the small panel that was removed from the door? And Orlando was 69 years old, frail and in poor health. Despite all the evidence saying they were innocent, the Durbanos were arrested for the murder of Mary and Charles. Then, on May 26, 1919, after a five-day trial, Frank and Lorando were found guilty. Frank was sentenced to hang for the crime, while his father was given a life sentence. The city was shocked, believing their innocence Soon afterwards, Charles and Rose divorced. Then, in a shocking turn of events, a year later, on December 7, 1920, Rose confessed she had falsely accused the men. Rose explained she was jealous of the rival grocers and hated them. She viewed this as her chance to blame them for the murder of her daughter. Luckily, this was before Frank was executed. He and his father, Lorando, were soon released from prison. During this time in prison, however, more attacks had taken place. Just four days later after the attacks, a letter was published in the Times newspaper of New Orleans, supposedly written by the Axeman. It read in part, Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me. For I am invisible. I am not a human being, but a spirit of a fell demon from the hottest hell. I am what you New Orleans and your foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come again and claim one of your victims. Undoubtedly, you New Orleans think of me as the most horrible murderer which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wish, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in a close relationship with the angel of death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15, earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I'm going to visit New Orleans again. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make the proposition to you people. Here it is. I'm very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared. Whose home, a jazz band, is in full swing at the time I have mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, one thing is certain. And that is that some of those people who do not have a jazz band on Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe.
on the next Tuesday, May 19, 1919. Jazz music would be heard throughout the city as the residents of New Orleans met the demands of the Axeman. No murders took place that night. The Axeman had kept his word. On the night of August 10, 1919, Steve Polka, a local grocer, was soundly asleep. Upon hearing a soft noise, he woke to find a dark figure hovering over him. Almost immediately, he fell back and passed out. On regaining his consciousness, Polka fell out of bed and amazingly made his way to a nearby neighbor's house. Frank Janinsu, upon hearing a knock, quickly opened his door, only to see Polka quickly collapse and lose consciousness. Frank quickly caught Boca in his arms. Boca's skull had been cracked, and he was covered in blood. He quickly called for an ambulance. It soon arrived and took Boca to the nearest hospital. In time, Boca slowly made a recovery. Like many of the other survivors, he was unable to describe his attack. Detectives soon found a panel chiseled from the door and recovered a bloody axe at the scene of the crime. As in many of the other cases, nothing had been taken. On the evening of September 2nd, 1919, just one short month after the brutal attack on Steve Boca, William Carson, local pharmacist, was having a quiet evening at his home, reading. Suddenly, heard a scratching noise on the door. Taking no chances, the pharmacist picked up his nearby revolver and started shooting through the door. Carefully, he flung the door open to see who or whatever it was, but the door was gone. The police were called. They found on the door what they believed to be a chisel mark on one of the panels. William Carson had escaped from what was believed to be another attack. On September 3rd, the very next day, a local neighbor went to check on 19-year-old Sarah Law. She was slightly worried because she hadn't been seen all day. Unable to get her to answer the door when she was knocking, she reluctantly decided to break into the home. She found Lawman in her bed, unconscious. Blood was gushing from her head, coming from a large wound. You could also see that some of her was found in the yard. This time, it appeared the perpetrator had made his entrance and exit through the window. Amazingly, Sarah survived her attack. Sarah wasn't able to give detectives any accurate description as to who her assailant was. The doctors who examined Sarah were not convinced the wound was caused by an axe. The wound seemed to be circular in shape. This, along with different method of entry, as well as less violent force used in the attack, left detectives questioning whether this was the work of another man or the Axeman. On October 27, just seven weeks later, the Axeman would strike again. This was to be his final assault. A local grocer named Mike Pepitone was attacked while asleep in his home. Pepitone's wife, Esther, asleep also, was awoken by a moaning sound. Upon awakening, she saw what she believed to be a dark figure of two men quickly leaving the room. Esther looked across the room to see her husband was hurt and bleeding. She quickly went to check on the couple's six children, and the police were quickly called. Mike Pepitone's skull had been fractured in several places. Blood from the attack was splattered all over the walls and on the ceiling. Miraculously, Mike Pepitone was still alive when the police arrived. But his fight to survive was short-lived. He was taken to a local hospital where he
very soon got me. Esther Peptone's version of the event stated said she didn't get a good view of either men, but one was tall, thin, the other was shorter and stockier. Whether there were two men or in the darkness and the panic, she was mistaken. But soon afterwards, the attack stopped. Although the attack stopped in New Orleans, other axe murders took place across the country, but none have ever been linked to the axe attack. On December 2nd, 1920, a man identified by the name of Joseph Mumphrey was shot dead in Los Angeles by a female. On the arrest, it was discovered the murderer was no other than Esther Pepitone. During the trial, Esther, who had since reached had killed Joseph Mumphrey because she claimed he was the person responsible for the murder of her husband in 1998. It was reported that Esther Pepitone was sentenced to 10 years in prison for the murder of Joseph Mumphrey, but only served three. Researchers since have found evidence that although the shooting did occur, Esther Pepitone was spared any jail time. Many questions remain unanswered. Why did Esther Pepitone state she couldn't identify her husband's killer? And yet, a year later, she was able to do so without hesitation. Had her mind become clearer since then? Some believe she used her husband's murder to get a more lighter sentence. After the accusation in New Orleans, Joseph Mumphrey was briefly investigated. They found Joseph Mumphrey indeed was in New Orleans during the time of the attacks. He had also been there earlier in the attacks of 1910 and 1912. Each gap in activity also coincided with the times that Joseph Mumphrey was there. Was the Axeman of New Orleans finally found? There is no question he was an evil man, but was he responsible for all the murders? killer struck fear into the city for over a year, and then just vanishing, and leaving many questions unanswered. Did he take up killing elsewhere? Was he killed himself? Was he arrested for another unrelated crime? Was he responsible for all the killings? These are questions that will probably never be answered.